Greetings. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for coming to this workshop on anarchist revolutionary strategy. I see some uh, some of my close friends, <laughs> housemates, here, and some new faces. And so, um, but I'm going to pretend that nobody's heard any of this stuff before, and we're going to go at it that way and, and talk uh, straight. So the topic is uh, anarchist revolutionary strategy. So this is a workshop on how to defeat capitalists and establish anarchy. Uh, now notice that I didn't say destroy capitalism. I said defeat capitalists because ap uh, capitalism is just an abstraction and cap capitalism is actually run by concrete real life people, capitalists, defeat capitalists. So that's more, brings it down to earth. And these people are identifiable, we, can, we know who they are, we know that they keep the system going, and so it's much better. And um, <clears throat> uh, you've caught me on a day when I'm a little bit agitated <clears throat> because of our situation. And this is a fight that we finally must win. Now, I want to stress that. We finally must win this fight lest we perish along with all life on earth murdered by capitalists. That's actually the title of a talk I hope to give soon. <laughs> I've got the notes here. <laughs> but that's not for tonight. That's, uh, that's for down the way. So the reasons for the urgency is, um, as you probably many of you heard me talk about before, is the global warming. And uh, I wrote a paper uh, on this. By the way, uh, for those of you who are uh, watching this on uh, in the digital world, hello. <laughs> and uh, I'll be mentioning papers, and all these papers are on my website. I made up a packet for the people who are here of the papers. And um, unless otherwise noted, uh, they're on my website, which is jamesherrod.info. That's www. J A M E S. H E R O D dot I N F O, James Shera dot info. So, this paper, Capitalist Global Warming and Climate Justice Movement, was published uh, uh, last summer, I think, or maybe two summers ago, and it spells out the problem. The problem is we're approaching uh, tipping points, and <clears throat> if, if we pass those tipping points, uh, irreversible global warming will start and we're dead. So that's the, the main problem with, with the oceans are dying, the mass extinctions coming plus peak oil. I'm just running through these very quickly uh, on what causes the urgency, why I say um, that uh, we, we must uh, do this. We have, we've got 20 years, maybe 30. So, um, so there have been um, 500 years of resistance to capitalism. This is a book. Um, he just deals with European radicals. It's uh, 500 years of revolution, European radicals from Huss to Lenin. Lee's an anarchist. But there are books that survey the anarchist history too, and also the pamphlet making the rounds on 500 years of resistance of indigenous peoples. The, the struggle has been continuous, uh, beginning with the enclosures movement in Europe when they're forcing the peasants off. So, this is what we're faced. We're faced with a system that has withstood 500 years of, of resistance. It's just phenomenal, and it has. Uh, we we can't underestimate the resiliency of cap the capitalist system and capitalists to recoup. Um, so I've been thinking about this for some time. Um, what I'll do is I take them off the stack here and put them over here, and this stack finished. <laughs> so uh, I wrote a book. Uh, <clears throat> Early on, uh, 1973, how do we get there? This is on my website, the critique of the question, what do you do? Uh, early 70s, I was uh, focusing on critique of the Vanguard Party strategy because a lot of my friends became old leftists. They, uh, toward the end of the 60s, as things got um, more radical and militant, a lot of people shifted back to the old left. I call them the new old left. Anyway, I wrote a critique of this um, so I've, I have uh, some history, unfortunately there were a couple of decades that were lost, but I nevertheless continued to ponder the question, 
So, and then I wrote this book in uh, 1996, the core of it, and then kept adding to it. So this is Getting Free, um, How to Defeat, no, Creating an Association of Democratic Autonomous Neighborhoods. This book is about how to defeat capitalists and establish anarchy. And um, the key thing is how to get out of wage labor into cooperative labor. That's the key thing with capitalism. Capitalism is based on commodification of labor. That means you have to have a job to have an income. That's how they've really got us. So I think this strategy would work if we had time. But what I've recently been worried about is that we don't have time. So there's a new question that um, we <laughs> actually yesterday morning at breakfast, <laughs> we, we, we worked on this question. The new question is how to defeat capitalists quickly. This is a different order than, you know, taking a few decades to do it. This is, the book is based on how to gut capitalist institutions, take power and wealth out of them, and build autonomous communities, sustainable communities, but that, that could take some time. Okay, so uh, that's um, what we're going to be talking about. All right, now I'm going <clears> to <throat> move on to section two. You've got the outline here. I gave everyone an outline for the talk. And a review of historical strategies, and we can go through this pretty fast. Uh, most of you have heard me say this before anyway. But uh, there are two failed strategies. I call them the status strategies um, that were prevalent for almost 100 years. The one was Leninism, Bolshevism. This is seize the state with two armed revolution. And then there was a, an electoral version of that, uh, capture the state through electoral politics and parties. The idea was to build mass working class parties in capture the state. And both uh, these uh, strategies thought you once you got the state, you could use the state to get to communism. Communism meant ever, for everybody at that time, um, society without states. This was uh, consensed on in the 19th century, everybody, that was what communism meant. It didn't mean what it came to be meant later with uh, Leninism. So both of those stat strategies have failed. Um, through nearly a century of trials. Uh, Western Europe was covered with um, social democratic parties sometimes for decades in Finland and, um, and Scandinavia. They had all over in France. Mitterrand was the last one. He came in, he was really radical. He wanted to, uh, to change things, but he was stopped cold. Okay, so there was an um, anarcho-syndicalist strategy that was sort of on the historical agenda a little bit. Um, and it was um, based on uh, workers' councils. So this was a marginalized strategy. It wasn't nearly uh, the same as these <coughs> status strategies, but nevertheless, in all the um, big revolts in Europe in the, throughout the 20th century, workers' councils were a key element. Things shifted to workers' councils, and anarcho-syndicalism. That means syndicalism is a French word for for unions, so it was based on union strategy, and it's based on seizing the workplace, establishing councils, building councils into dual power structure, and eventually getting getting rid of the state. So that hasn't worked out either. Um, and um, I um, I have a uh, there's a there's a massive literature on on. Uh, Work of self-management, and here's a bibliography on it, work of self-management. So that's in the packet, and it's on my website. If you want to explore um, that whole tendency of anarcho-syndicalism. By the way, back on my book, um, in that same year, it was published in 19, uh, 2007, I went to a, a, um, a forum, and it was mostly about reformists, Participating in reformist things, and I came up with a list of things that we could do that were revolutionary. It's based on my, my book. I'll just read them. Agitate through the establishment of assemblies at work, bypassing unions in households, neighborhoods. Agitate, persuade small family businesses to convert to co ops. Agitate to persuade NGOs to convert to direct democracy. Agitate to persuade small towns to convert to direct democracy. Agitate to establish households and co housing. 
agitate to discredit representing the government and foster direct democracy, <coughs> and agitates for solidarity networking with existing worker-owned businesses. So this was uh, based on things we could do to get assemblies in these different arenas. Considering what's been happening the last few years, it seems very anemic. I mean, kind of, um, uh, you know, and nothing about insurrection in here or uh, popular assemblies taking over popular squares. Anyway, um, there was that. Okay, so we're, um, okay, so there are three strategies that were on the historical scene are gone. And the, the table had been swept clean. So we, we, we're finally, anarcho-communism is on the historical agenda. That's, that's the way I read the situation. It's finally uh, on the historical agenda. Anarcho-communism is a focus on communities, autonomous communities. It was never really uh, tried. There was a brief, brief appearance in, in the Spanish uh, Revolution. But remember, that was a predominantly um, peasant society, and so they still had a tradition of, of, of uh, villages and peasant um, councils, village councils. So they used those, they, they seized the land, and for a couple of years they had uh, autonomous village um, um, councils. It was, that's the closest, uh, the Spanish uh, Revolution sort of combined workers' uh, control with um, community. Now I'll discuss uh, popular assemblies separately below when we get to the uh, recent stuff of the <coughs> occupation. Okay, so I want to review now other strategies that have failed. I have in the packet um, a copy of uh, chapter 5 in my book. It's called Strategies That Have Failed. And I, I've already mentioned uh, social democracy and Leninism and syndicalism. Uh, I'll just read through the rest of the list. Guerrilla warfare, general strike, strikes, unions, insurrections, civil disobedience, single issue campaigns, demonstrations, new social movements, boycotts, dropping out, Luddism, publishing, education. <laughs> so, uh, people read this and they say, why don't we just do everything? Which is a, a good point. Um, but I think I was correct in this assessment that by themselves these cannot defeat capitalists. Remember, the goal is to, de to defeat capitalists. So I'm judging these as tactics or strategies from that point of view. It's not that they didn't accomplish good things. But I'd like to highlight just a, um, a couple of them. Um, I might get... No, I don't take it separately. Um, uh, one of my uh, <clears throat> wet blankets that I throw is about street protests. I just don't think that they're effective. And um, I get in a lot of trouble about this because that's what we do, mostly. In the last 10 years in Boston, we've organized just one street press protest. But this is not a, a United States phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. The addiction to street protests and marching and rallies is worldwide. And when we tried to stop the um, U.S. from invading Iraq, that's what they did. We, it was the most incredible. It was the first global demonstration. <coughs> but it was just street marches. And I have argued for a long time. In this book uh, I wrote in uh, 1973, I, I, I took a, I took, uh, I disagreed with the, the mass, the tactic of mass demonstrations, going to Washington, D.C. all the time. So um, that's um, um, a critique I've written on that. And uh, I have a paper called The Weakness of a Politics of Protest. So um, I spell that out. I wrote this in June 2000, right with the present upsurge of the new anarchist movement. And I was worried that we'd go through 10 years, just like we did in the 60s. And while we're doing it with street protests, uh, we'd end up just the same. It would just uh, fizzle out. And a lot of it's come true, but still, um, um, there's uh, two sides to the question. Um, I think the protests are mainly a form of petition, but um, anyway, I urge you to read this and get the critique of uh, street protests. Unions, I think, uh, here's my take on unions. They have failed to destroy capitalism through nearly 150 years. 
they started, we got unions in the middle of the 19th century, and they almost immediately became business unions, with very rare exceptions. And um, the idea, and of course another point is that unions were built during a period when there were massive communist and socialist and anarchist movements, mass movements. To think that we can rebuild unions now without those mass movements just to get better wages, I think, is, is an illusion. We're not going to rebuild unions. So the whole thing of turning to unions is, um, I think, not going to hurt capitalists. They've co-opted them long ago. And also, it's the structure of the union itself. It's outside of the workplace. What we need are assemblies inside the workplace. So that's my take on unions. The same thing with strikes. In general strikes, strikes are uh, to gain a particular thing in, uh, in the workplace, like better wages, health care, or grievances about uh, health conditions, stuff like that. They're not really designed to overthrow capitalism. I've used the phrase, over defeat capitalists. Um, in general strikes, which we, they tried to do just um, um, last Wednesday in Oakland, well, a general strike, they just waited out. The ruling class just waits it out. The biggest one in my life, uh, the general strike that I'm aware of, was the French uh, general strike in 68. Because the students were, the students had made a connection with the working class in France in 1968. And the working class went out. And it lasted for six weeks. It was long. Long. This was a big general strike. And of course the union sold it out. They eventually tried to get everybody to go back to work and they made concessions. And there was some um, emphasis on um, councils. Um, not like uh, before, in the anarchist syndicalist movement, in, in all the big revolutions in Europe, uh, in Hungary in 1956, it just covered with workers' <coughs> councils. And Italy in 1918-19, workers' councils. So workers' councils, these were, were actually workers seized the means of production. And so, um, okay, now we come to um, <clears throat> guerrilla war and armed struggle. I say in my book that guerrilla warfare doesn't work uh, anymore, and they've learned how to defeat guerrilla war. Guerrilla warfare, and my proof is that, uh, just, just look at the cases. I mean, in Colombia, the guerrillas struggled for 40 years, and they didn't succeed. In Iraq, everybody said the guerrilla warfare was going was to defeat the invasion. They didn't. In fact, it was, they ended up getting bought off by the United States government. So I believe that the United States has pretty much succeeded in Iraq, although um, I hate to <laughs> disagree with the man who was thinking. Wallenstein, he says that well, the U.S. has failed in Iraq, and they're believing but it was, certainly wasn't because of guerrilla warfare. The guerrilla warfare ended years ago. And it might be because the puppet government they set up simply isn't cooperating. And so that's a whole different thing. I argued from the beginning that um, the Iraqis would have been better through massive, socially organized non-cooperation. This is not a non-violent strategy. It's not non-cooperation. So... Um, now, the idea that we can defeat the uh, ruling class with military means, I think, is really far-fetched. They've got so many weapons now, it's just the most incredibly armed ruling class in history. This doesn't mean we don't fight, but we have to find a way to defeat them through social means. Now we get to this thorny issue of um, violence, nonviolence. By the way, back on uh, anarchist syndicalism, I wrote a little critique of that. It's in the packet. <laughs> We're going back and forth here. I'm going, getting ahead of myself. It's got to be rewritten in uh, a little more nuanced way, but um, I read that at the talk I gave in Philadelphia. So, okay, nonviolence. We have got to stop using these words. Totally. Just stop using violence. It's a duality that is really um, distorting things for us. And it puts us into a trap. Um, the ruling class preaches nonviolence incessantly. The media, the, the corporate controlled media, preach nonviolence incessantly. They never stop. 
Um, here we have a ruling class that is the most murderous you can imagine. They just recently murdered a million people in Iraq without blinking an eye. But if some kid breaks the Starbucks window, it's like the world is coming to an end. If this is how upside down this whole thing is on violence and nonviolence. Um, I was interviewed when I was doing the pamphlet table at the Occupy Boston, uh, I was interviewed by the Boston Herald. And the first question they asked me was, how long can this go on before it becomes violent? Imagine that. This is, a, this is the most right-wing country you can imagine. And they support all the wars all over. Um, if you uh, would add up the number of people killed um, by all the protests in the United States since World War II, by everything, civil rights, anti-war, everything, I bet it wouldn't come to more than a dozen or two people. I mean, the protest movement don't kill people. But if you add up the number of people, the ruling class, the capitalist, U.S. capitalist ruling class has killed since World War II, it's into the millions, millions of people. This is outright killed, like in uh, Vietnam, uh, two or three million. In, um, in, uh, in Iraq, over one million, 1.2 million. But then you've got all the, the, the more limited things, like 200,000 uh, activists and labor union uh, organizers killed in Guatemala over a, a period of years, 200,000. So what they do is they murder. They murder. So if we're going to talk about violence, let's stop talking about Let's start talking about concrete things. Concrete things. How many people are killed? You know, uh, how many people do they kill just through the system? Like um, capitalist-induced famines kills lots of people. Diseases that could be cured except for capitalism. Just enormous. The 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 toll the the human toll um, by um, capitalists is is phenomenal. So I, uh, we got to do something about this um, violence, nonviolence thing. I think you just stop talking about it. Here's a good, um, <laughs> as I've just talked about it, right? <laughs> Here, this is a great little uh, quote from um, open letter from the anarchist participant in the Oakland strike. It's not a, oh, this is from Egypt. The Egyptian occupiers wrote this about violence. By the way. Totally false. The mainstream media is saying that the Egyptian occupation was um, nonviolent. It was not. They, they had fierce fighting for several days right there in the square because they were being attacked by the secret police. And also, uh, this is about defending the, the bridge. So it's not our desire to participate in violence, but it's even less our desire to lose. If we do not resist actively when they come to take what we have one back, then we will surely lose. Do not confuse the tactics that we use when we shouted peaceful with fetishizing nonviolence. If the state had given up immediately, we would have been overjoyed. But as they sought to abuse us, beat us, kill us, we knew that there was no other option than to fight back. Had we laid down and allowed ourselves to be arrested, tortured, and martyred to make a point, we would be no less bloody, beaten, and dead. Be prepared to defend these things you have occupied, that you are building, because after everything else has been taken from us, these reclaimed spaces are so very precious. I joked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, occupa that's the occupation. Capturing the space and defending. If we were able to set up neighborhood assemblies, they would be attacked, no doubt about it just like the popular assemblies in the squares are being attacked. But hopefully there would be so many that it would be, it would be harder. Um, uh, ubiquitous, that's what I think would be our strength against the overwhelming military might of the ruling class. Ubiquitous, everywhere. That we, we have a slogan, occupy everything. Uh, but occupying the squares, we'll get to that later. Um, Anyway, I wanted to read that. There are a couple good books that everybody should read. Um, Peter Gellerloos, How Nonviolence Protects the State, and um, one by uh, Ward Churchill called Passivism as Pathology. This is not advocating violence. It's advocating the right to defend ourselves and the things we create and our lives. Okay, so that's... 
violence, nonviolence. All right, I'm going to tease out the strategy implications of current anarchist tendencies. Five o'clock. When do we start? 4.30 approximately? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think I'll make it. Actually, <clears throat> this is a paper, Anarchist Revolutionary Strategy. It's an outline I made up for a workshop back in 2006. And in here I list um, what uh, the various currents, contemporary currents of anarchism, um, anarcho-syndicalism and cousins, um, um, and libertarian municipalism related currents and um, so forth. And in this little essay, I, I tease these out. This is called um, Golden Strategy for Anarchy. It's on, the, uh, on my website. But um, here's the thing. Uh, if you look at these, let's just go through them briefly. Work of Solidarity Alliance, that's an anarcho-syndicalist, pretty much focused strictly on the workplace. Uh, anarcho-syndicalist Review, that's again a magazine, but it's... Um, okay, the Wobblies... Oh my god, what do I say here? <laughs> uh, so many of my friends are Wobblies, and two, two or three of my closest friends have devoted their lives to, to the... IWW, and it's a wonderful uh, organization, and they do wonderful things, and it has a fantastically rich tradition of rebellion and revolt. But the thing is that they still have this concept of one big union, and the union is a structure outside of the workplace. And I've been looking through um, some of the recent uh, papers, and I, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think they focus much on workers' councils, on getting... Uh, councils. It's more or less standard uh, workplace stuff. So I personally think this is a dead end. I think the Wadleys have to really significantly <coughs> change their focus if they're going to be relevant to the um, the revolution that we we're hoping for. And the Situationist, uh, that's basically um, a kind of a worker control focused um, thing. This section I'm looking at is uh, anarcho-syndicalists, anarcho-communism, and cousins. And there again, it's focused on the, the syndicalist model of work, workers' councils, building councils, and so forth. Okay, the libertarian municipalism was a strategy uh, advanced by Murray Bookchin. It hasn't caught on. Nobody, nobody has ever. Uh, it was the idea of capturing the local governments through elections and then dismantling the government. And so... This couldn't happen more than once or twice, and people would say, we're not voting for you because you're going to disband the government. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, it hasn't caught on, but uh, his writing about um, decentralized uh, popular assemblies is very relevant. And so then we get to um, surrealists haven't done anything about strategy except <laughs> Thomas Marxism... Uh, Libertarian social individualists haven't. So if you okay, we got primitivists <laughs> under, under the individualists. We got primitivists and ontological anarchists. This is my categorization: crime thing, and the so-called post up anarchism. And um, the main strategic um, thing they put forward is attack. Attack everything. Uh, okay, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, under uh, insurrections. All right, so that's the list. Uh, the, the conclusion I come through, through uh, teasing out strate strategy and placing current anarchist tendencies is um, we don't much have a strategy. <laughs> so, Okay, um, <laughs> contemporary anarchist project. This is even more startling. If you look at what we're actually doing, the historical strategies don't have much bearing on it at all. Food Not Bombs, Anarchist Black Cross bookstores, and then all the other things. We're doing a lot of other things besides these two. These are three of our main uh, organizational projects. We organize uh, protests and demonstrations, solidarity, critique the... Uh, the conventions, Republican and Democratic. 
<coughs> so Tuna Vams uh, could, um, if it could change more to be much more political and try to focus on um, the whole question of food uh, and not just be such a service um, organization. Food is an incredible topic and if it could get the idea of non-commodified food into the air, food should not be a commodified, but nothing should be commodified. But I'm not sure that giving away free meals gets that idea across. Uh, and bookstores are necessary. Oh, I'm going to skip that. Okay. Uh, possible grand convergence. This will be quick. There are so many things happening in the world, and it's possible they could converge into an anti capitalist anarchist movement. But first, they would have to become anti capitalist. And what does that mean? It means breaking the link between having a job and having an income. This is the core of capitalism. You have to have a job. That's commodified labor. So the whole thing of getting out of capitalism is to get out of the market. So you get out of commodified, you get it from uh, labor that's bought and sold to cooperative labor. That's, that's what my book is about. So I think that's how you do it. And in the process you get out of markets, out of commodified markets. So everything is a commodity. That's the definition of capitalism. They want to commodify everything. So, but anyway, here, look, listen to all these movements. Um, regionalism, these very successionist movements. The in, indigenous autonomous movements, Mexico, Bolivia, Peru, Chile. Um, sustainable agriculture, urban gardening, eco villages, intentional communities, co-housing. Um, radical environmentalism is a direct attack on capital. Slow food movement, alternative energies. Participatory budgeting, this is in um, Brazil. Um, um, local currencies. So that's a long list. Uh, did I mention transi transition towns? Um, so that's a lot of good things are happening and I hope they do converge into an um, anti-capitalist global movement. All right. All right, we're up to some current issues, um, workplace versus community. I have a paper that I wrote for the, the establishment of the Great Plains Association of Anarchy in uh, 2002. I went to that conference, I wrote this paper, and I cover a lot of the issues um, that we're fa still facing. An association, not federation, but anyway, in here I have a paragraph on the Workplace versus community organization. This is a totally false distinction. We should just forget about it. We have to do both. We have to do both. Um, and even the historical anarchist movement has sort of been split between anarcho syndicalists focusing on the workplace, anarcho communists focusing on the communities. This is no good. Um, so uh, I, I, you, you might want to read that. Then I'd like to say a word about counter institutions because it's often said that we are building counter institutions and uh, that's going to help us. But it depends on the counter institution. And most of the counter institutions we built in the 60s didn't hurt capitalists at all. We had bike shops, just like we do now. We had alternative um, this and alternative that even had alternative daycare centers and uh, they just co-opted them all. So um, it depends on what, you, what you're what you doing. If, if the alternative institution is primarily a service institution, then um, it's not going to hurt capitalists. So I think the alternative institutions we need are, are the assemblies. This would, this would take, um, start taking power away. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip um, those other things, uh, the troublesome abstractions. I'll just focus on one, which is organization. This is the big one. There's a huge dispute in the anarchist <coughs> movement over organization. Both, uh, both among ourselves and in the movement. The way I, I think this is the most unfortunate um, 
dispute, and it's an abstraction. The organization is, I have a little paper plan called um, Troublesome Abstractions, and the main ones are work, the left, civilization, democracy, organization. And my approach to this is that we might need to distinguish between organizing ourselves as anarchists and organizing anarchy itself which would be setting up the institutions we, we need to have an anarchist society. And that would be um, mainly the assemblies and also a whole range of institutions that we can institute like uh, uh, really, really free markets or I, I call them storehouses in my book where you, you put stuff in and you take stuff out. It's, some places called the, real, the free stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could do that right now in every neighborhood. We could have a free store. This would be an, in, an institution that would be actually organizing anarchy as opposed. Now, um, we need anarchists organized as anarchists to do propaganda work and educational work. But um, the people who are setting up organizations usually have uh, something else in mind. And I, I'll come to that next. But um, in general, um, the people who are against organization are a little bit self-contradictory because uh, most of them are organized um, quite successfully into small publishing groups like Crime Think. My God, they publish incredible amount of stuff. And, um, and so uh, they... Um, but they're against formal education. But the whole thing is just confused. Why don't they say we're against formal bureaucratic organizations rather than organization as an abstraction? All right, now the main thing on, um, on the, the organizational side is <clears throat> I believe that a lot of Leninist ideas, concepts, tendencies, attitudes, have carried over into the formal anarchist organizations. And um, I wrote a, a lengthy critique of the one in England called the Anarchist Federation. It was called Anarchist Communist Federation at that time, February 1999. I reviewed their, um, starting their uh, strategy pamphlet, and then they kept revising it, so I kept reviewing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it kept getting longer and longer, the critique. But this is, I, I, I really think this is a good paper. And I point out how many of their, their concepts and attitudes are carryovers from Vanguard Party, from Leninist Vanguard Party. And one of the most important is the idea that it is the job of anarchists to organize the working class to make the revolution. I heard this in uh, Chicago just a couple years ago. I went to... Uh, Finding Our Roots conference, and there was a young man got up and said, the only task of anarchists is to organize workers to make the revolution. You know, this is so, this is so weird and anachronistic. It's just, it's straight out of both of us. The workers can't organize themselves. They need, they need outside help. Um, so, um, but I have a whole other set of con concepts in here. Um, they use the concept of mass constantly, mass action, mass movement, revolutionary masses, mass organization, even mass decision making. Whatever can that mean? Compan um, it's, of course, that goes with the elite. They don't ever say that. But it's mass elite, or the, that's the society capitalist that created mass elite. So, um, but then I, I go on and I um, um, fared out their whole attitude toward their very mechanical and wooden concept of the working class. Their time span of the revolution. I think it's kind of, they keep talking about the revolution happening and then in between revolutionary outbursts of the working class, they're going to they're gonna capture the initiatives of the working class and save them until the next uprising. This is just Bolshevism. Uh, I know a lot about Bolshevism because I studied it intensively in the early 70s because a lot of my friends became old leftists. And that seemed to be what was happening. 
the, the most militant people in the new left, the ones who didn't go back to law school, uh, <laughs> became, one of them, they became Stalinist. How can you believe that? In the 70s, became Stalinist. <coughs> and then, of course, we had RCP, <coughs> and they've lasted for decades. They're still putting out their papers. They're everywhere. There's probably no more than 500 in the whole country. But <laughs> they do such enormous damage. <laughs> you can edit that out. No. <laughs> the role of the revolutionary organization, that's part of this strategy. All right, I'll pass on that. So I read this paper. This is really good paper. All right, now we come to the really hot items. Insurrection. <coughs> In the current occupation. This is so exciting. Insurrections. All right. <clears throat> this little book came out not long ago, Coming Insurrection. I read it. It's a very exciting book um, in many ways. They hate the current system furiously. And um, I like that. And I like their... their um, well, it was very sophisticated. It was sort of a better version of crime think. Crime think has been pushing inspectionism, although they changed so much. Uh, people tell me they've evolved again. Um, anyway, I wrote up a little blurb on the insurrection, the coming insurrection. The problem I had with it at the end was their approach to decision making. Um, well, another problem I had was. I didn't, if you attack everything and you start destroying the infrastructure, uh, you're just, people, pe people are not going to join you. They're going to say, hey, you're destroying what we need to live. So they're going to define you as a terrorist right off. They won't even need to listen to Fox News to do this. They'll just automatically, you'll be a terrorist. So um, that's the idea of attack, attack, attack everything uh, is crazy. In one point they say in here, well, we have to make sure that we have a way to survive afterwards. But, you know, if they had followed that out, they would have seen that, well, they're not doing anything to make sure that we have the means to survive. So it's not part of the strategy. The strategy is attack and destroy. But what turned me off about it was decision making, because I focus on that a lot. Um, it is their approach to decision making that really condemns the book in my eyes. They are against deciding. They think decision will just happen, that is, be reflected in actions that are taken when the time comes. This sort of spontaneous or organic informal approach to decision making is typical of crime thinking and the primitivism flies in the face of the whole enlightenment tradition of hoping that humans can get conscious deliberative, deliberative, deliberative control over the social forms they create. I don't see how we could have a self-managed society without assemblies and decision-making. And that means meetings. God, awful meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I have a book downstairs. Uh, called, I've forgotten the title. It's something about uh, the end of the world or something. Meetings. But anyway, I love meetings. I love meetings. They're very important. And um, and uh, it's 5:20. I'm wrapping this up. Okay. Um, okay. Greece. <clears throat> this is under in the title of insurrection. Unbelievable <coughs> uprising. This is so exciting. And so this brings everything to the fore because. Um, um, the anarchists were there, they have a long tradition, they have, uh, it's a very different society, the protesting is normal, <laughs> throwing Molotov cocktails at police is normal, <laughs> as opposed to here, there was one picture of a protester prodding a cop, he was standing on the steps and he had this 10 foot pole and he was prodding the cop. If that happened here, he'd be shot dead, you know. Uh, so it's a very different society. Another key thing is that cops can't go into the universities in Greece. 
So they go out and attack uh, the cops, and then they run back to the university. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, this is this is a weird situation and from our from the point of view of the United States. I mean, this is this is the most one of the most repressed societies in the world. Um, so anyway, uh, here's what I want to say about Greece. They've done everything. Uh, they started out occupying the squares. They had public assemblies. And they, these were started by anarchists. And the, the assemblies were called to deal with a particular problem. They're going to destroy our parks, so let's have an assembly and stop them. They're going to do this, so have an assembly. So these were um, issue-oriented public assemblies. So, you know, but then that didn't work, so they, they, they organized strikes. And then they started occupying buildings. They occupied uh, labor union buildings, city halls. They occupied... Um, uh, lots of things with the universities, of course. And then they had started having strikes. They had a general strike. They just recently had a two-day general strike, 48-hour general strike, and it was general strike. And the purpose was to stop the austerity programs from being voted in by the government. But it didn't. So here's the issue that Greece raises. What in the world do you have to do to stop this? You know, we'll consider that in the next topic, which I'm coming up to, is what if. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be fun. <laughs> what if. Um, so here, the question we, I'm ending up with was how do we defeat capitalists quickly? Okay, let's go on the occupation movement. All right, um, <clears throat> this is totally unprecedented and exciting. Um, it combines... Um, the strategy of occupation with with the strategy of public assemblies, and the target was geniusly selected, Wall Street. Uh, it just everyone knows that they had billions of dollars to bail out Wall Street. By the way, bailout is a wrong phrase because bailout assumes that you're doing something useful and you got into trouble, so people are going to help you, going to bail you out. But they weren't doing anything useful. They're speculating. They're gamblers. So they were gambling. And uh, so when they when they gambles turn out good, when they win, they keep the money. When they lose, they go running to Congress. They go running to the government to, to make good their losses. That's what the bailout means, making good our gambling losses. That's all that means. And they got uh, $13 trillion, But the, the final estimate is that I've read is $23 trillion that's promised over the years. Basically what they did was they privatized the U.S. Treasury Department. They took over the Treasury Department. They captured it. So, okay, uh, so, um, oh, that was on the selection of the target. But um, what's exciting to me is the assemblies, and I want to take <coughs> five minutes just to give a very quick review of the notion of popular assemblies, because this is key. The first, of course, was in ancient Greece. That's where direct democracy started. And so they... Um, I have a bibliography. It's a very brief, not comprehensive at all, but it's there. Popular neighborhood assemblies. And so the key person to read on ancient Greece is um, Cornelius Castoriadis. He's one of the greatest theorists of um, direct democracy and autonomy. And he focuses a lot on, uh, he has some good essays on ancient Greece. But the archaic societies, like uh, David Graeber claims that all our archaic societies have councils and assemblies. It's just natural with them. They have direct democracy. Uh, and that's where he became convinced that consensus was good because the last, there's no external authority. They can't enforce uh, their decisions. There's no police. So if you're going to have uh, a collective project and a collective action, you have to get as many people on board as possible. That's why the last thing they want to do is to take a vote. So they keep talking and discussing until they reach consensus. Um, okay, so there are the archaic societies. Medieval towns have had assemblies in the American Revolution. Oh, I forgot to pull that book. It's called The First American Revolution. It's a good book um, in, uh, by um, um, Raphael. And it's called, it's between 1774 and 76. The state of Massachusetts completely overthrew the British government, except in Boston. And they had a two year experiment in direct democracy based on popular town assemblies. So um, then the French Revolution, Saint Colotts, 
Uh, Paris Commune was an assembly. Well, then after the Paris Commune, things shifted to the workplace and work, workplace councils. But in recent years, we've got assemblies again in all of the big revolts. Okay, here it starts in, uh, in Algeria, 2001. You've got to read this book. You can't kill us. We're already dead. Argentina's ongoing popular uprising. This is a, put out by Firestarter Press. It's a compilation of um, their, um, their demands and the history, the chronology. It was an incredible revolt. It lasted for a long time. It was based on uh, local assemblies. What they did is they revived an ancient village tradition. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, and this is true, I'll say this now, this is true for all the other assemblies. It didn't spread to the workplaces. And it didn't spread to the rest of the country. It just went to eastern Algeria. So, okay, in Argentina, <coughs> same thing. Here's a great little pamphlet. Argentina's Popular Rebellion. And then there's a book put out called Horizontalism by Marina um, Citrin. Citrin? Sitkin? Citrin, I think. It's a, it's a book on the assemblies in Argentina. So they established assemblies, and there they had uh, also workplace occupations, although these weren't um, occupations of functioning workplaces. They were occupations of abandoned factories. So it wasn't really an anarcho-syndicalist thing. These were workers that the capitalists had deserted the, the plant. And so they had 180 of these occupied, abandoned workplaces, and they, they kept them going. And uh, it was radical. They democratized inside and so forth. And they, uh, but it wasn't, uh, in a sense, anti-capitalist in the sense of trying to get out of the market. And also, there were hundreds of abandoned factory buildings. They did 180, which is good. All right, and then in Oaxaca, we had a popular assembly. When people decide, um, this came out of Oaxaca, 2006. So, <coughs> once again, it didn't spread to the workplaces. And it was one assembly for the whole city. It didn't spread to the neighborhoods. Although it did spread to um, small towns. Every small town in uh, the state of Oaxaca took over the city hall and set up um, an assembly. And it lasted for some months. Okay, you all know about Greece and Egypt, Spain, and then Occupy Wall Street. Um, well, I'll skip the rethinking consensus decision making. I've worked on that. Um, I think it's crucial. We have. There are many problems with consensus decision making which aren't being faced. And we have to make this work. We have to retool it. We have to revise it. Make it work. The assemblies have to work. We've got to get them to work. Because they're absolutely central. And I, uh, I was encouraged um, in Oakland. They had um, a huge outdoor assembly. Uh, 1,107 people, or maybe 77. It was an outdoor assembly, and they took a vote on whether to have the general strike. And it was um, 49 against 77 abstentions, and then the rest were four. So there they, 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 they adopted, they actually voted. I don't know how they counted the votes in an open assembly like that. But well, they do have sections, and people go around, and it's a mystery. But they, they, they gave the tally, they said they counted. So it would be next to impossible. That's a straight up and down vote. I mean, what, how could you use consensus? But anyway, I have a paper I included in the packet of um, um, concern on meeting procedures. And in there, I have uh, two letters that I wrote to Mian about this, about some of my concerns. And then I have a bibliography. We had a campaign um, in Mian, that's Northeast Anarchist um, uh, Network. We were going to study all the manuals and everything, uh, but it, it, it didn't go anywhere. All right, so here's the last question. How can we defeat capitalists quickly? If you think I have the answer to this, <laughs> I'd be disappointed. People have been saying, oh, <laughs> 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 years. 
to do this, and it's an unbelievably powerful, knowledgeable ruling class. But let's do some what ifs. Um, what if in Greece, again, instead of just surrounding the parliament building in the square, what if they had occupied it? Just occupied the parliament building. They did that in Wisconsin. So that lasted a couple of weeks, right, in Wisconsin. And, um, uh, but uh, they lost. They had to leave eventually or they were kicked out. And then uh, the governor went ahead and passed all those anti-union laws and right-wing laws. They, uh, they, oh, the thing is coming in the United States. The governor can just appoint someone to take over a city government. It's just unbelievable. It's, it's outright fascist corporate rule. You go in and you just void all of the democratic procedures. You install the manager. So anyway, that went through. And so, um, um, well, let's escalate it. So you'd say the Greeks, instead of just occupying parliament building, burned it. What if they burnt the parliament building? <laughs> this is a hypothetical question. <laughs> so, um, well, the, yesterday was this guy Fox Day, right? So, <laughs> so but anyway, would that actually stop the ruling class? <clears throat> well, hey, capitalists, they don't need the building. They, they have institutions. <laughs> they need somewhere else. They, as long as they control the decision making. So, um, well, what if we destroyed all the political parties? Well, how are you going to do that? I mean, how can you destroy the, the, the Democrats and Republicans? What do you do? Well, I tell you one way the ruling class did destroy a political party. Um, the Panthers was a political party. Here's how they did it. They killed. They murdered 27 of them. And then they jailed hundreds more, several hundred more. And then they went around the country and they burnt down every office of the Black Panthers. So that's how you destroy a political party. I'm not recommending that, but <laughs> I mean, that's how they did it. <laughs> I don't think we could do that to such a ubiquitous thing. But the, I don't think you could destroy it. You could say, well, uh, don't vote, but uh, the, the voting rate is really already very low. I mean, you can, you know, it could go down to 20% of the people voting and they still keep the system going, don't you think? Oh, you know, the Republicans won this vote by so many votes and such a percentage. So, so that's just a what if. What if we destroyed the political parties? Well, how? Well, we could, uh, capitalists, the whole system depends on taxes. So what if we stop paying taxes? Uh, massive. Well, you can't because uh, the corporations take the money out of your paychecks. So how do you stop paying taxes? You know, tax resistance movement. Um, you can opt out of that. What? You can opt out of getting your pre-tax. Anyway, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you can opt out of, I thought you could only opt out of uh, whether you wanted one deduction or two deductions. But anyway. You can't opt we'll, out? We'll do that. Well, delegitimize the police. How are we going to do that? Okay, so I, I have a couple of positive suggestions. <laughs> Spread the occupation from the square to the block to the shop, neighborhood workplace assembly. So I think, I think if we could escalate this uh, movement, things can change. And we might be in a period of uh, a massive sea change of consciousness uh, going on. <coughs> Even in America, you know how the Soviet, <coughs> Soviet uh, citizenry eventually realized everything coming over television was a lie? Well, we might be starting to get a little bit of that here, where the mainstream media is just not believed. My housemate the other day said that people can tell the difference between what they see on the media and what's happening in their lives, and so that could make, make it. So another campaign um, is to discredit representative government. I think this should be a focus of ours. Um, and we had such a campaign back in uh, 2008 leading up to that president. I've included that in your packet, anti-election campaign. It's got bibliography. It's got slogans and stuff. I had a whole bunch of slogans, but nobody liked them. Uh, <laughs> mine was um, electing leaders perpetuates your slavery. The era of representative government is over. Local assemblies, not national congress. Anti-federalists were right. Don't vote revolt, 
Actually, this got made into a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> no decision-making elites ever. Elections are a con game anywhere, anytime. If you want to be free, don't delegate your authority. Use, don't delegate your power. Why let someone else to decide for you? You're letting someone else decide for you. Is this smart? <laughs> Tens of thousands of neighborhood assemblies. Ours versus one... Uh, oh, here it is. Tens of thousands of neighborhood assemblies. Ours versus one national congress. Theirs. Mm -hmm. See, that would get them. <laughs> Ditch representative government everywhere. Okay, so I have some um, a pamphlet on that that I wrote. To reject campaign vigorously against representative government. Peter Kropotkin wrote a fabulous pamphlet in 1885. It's like he wrote it last month for us. <coughs> you know, it's just the most devastating indictment of representative government. And then... Uh, um, um, I uh, thought I had another paper. No, that was it. Okay. Well, that's it. <laughs>